I was glad when they said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us join now together in the Venite. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice.
a reading from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if, it's, if it is to be this way, why do I live? She went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I'm famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>
reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the flesh, but not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus went out and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. When he told them many, then, and he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. 
when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another, sixty, and in another, thirty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be back. I have a confession to make. I really, really love the Hebrew Bible, what we Christians usually call the Old Testament. As we move into the season after Pentecost in year A, I'm excited about the opportunity offered in our lectionary to step our way through these books from the beginning, the book of Genesis. Starting today, the next four lectionary selections feature the life of a very special figure in the story of Israel. So I invite you to follow along as we trace the path of a flawed yet fascinating character through both real and metaphorical hills and valleys. Genesis contains 50 chapters, and our reading today is from the 25th chapter. The first 11 covered what we call the primordial history from creation up until the time of the patriarchs. Then 14 chapters come on the life and events of the first patriarch, Abraham. And we catch glimpses of the second patriarch, Isaac, as a mostly passive figure mixed into the background. It's the third patriarch, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who takes over the story by force of personality and closes out the rest of the book, literally, as the book actually ends as he dies. These next 25 chapters, fully half the book of Genesis, deal with his life and his family. Paralleling the story a few weeks ago, featuring Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, and Isaac, we begin with an initially barren woman who ends up with two children, this time as twins. Rebecca's pregnancy is hardly a good omen. Her children struggle so mightily against each other in her womb that she shrieks out, this what even is my life? And off she trots to get an answer out of God. And in classic oracle fashion, the reply comes, two nations struggle, two peoples divided. Prevail one will, younger, older, serve one will. Rebecca hears what she wants. The younger will serve the older, in a reversal of tradition. But hidden in the Hebrew syntax, masked by most English translations, is a faint possible ambiguity between the object and the subject of the sentence. We're left asking, is life's every movement fated? Or do we have the ability to choose, yet then being forced to accept the consequences of our choice? Let's hold that thought for a moment. 
And so the magical moment of birth arrives. The eldest emerges red and hairy, like Austin Powers on the Oscars carpet, while the younger hauls heel on out of there. The play on words in naming throughout these stories is often lost in the English. The eldest is dubbed Esau, but it's actually Edom that is on the author's mind. You see, this whole story is both fully that of two specific individual people and representative of two later nation states, as the oracle predicted. Esau's line becomes the nation of Edom, a sworn enemy of the Israelites who come from Jacob's line. The tribe is named after the cliffs of red stone bordering their highlands, and one of their territories is called Ser, which means hairy. The hairy red guys. I get the sense our narrator is taking a bit of a dig. Jacob, or Yaakov, is a riff on the Hebrew for heel. How would you like that for a name? Every party, you know someone would ask, so how'd you get that name anyway? Well, when I was born, I was holding on to my brother's heel, so mom said, just call him heel grabber. And so our two young lads, Shaggy Red and Heel Grabber, grow up. On the surface, life may seem idyllic as they roam the fields and lounge in tents. But there's a dark undercurrent lurking in our narrator's words. We see that the father loves the hunting elder most, salivating over the wild game brought in, while the mother's love for her youngest is stated without condition. This may not be the healthiest family dynamic. Now, keep the narrator's descriptions in mind as we move to the first of two encounters. Esau was a skilled hunter, and Jacob was an honest man. Talented hunter, forthright man. Got it? Our first scene. Jacob the younger stirred the pot of vegetable stew, and Esau the elder stumbled into the tent, exhausted, empty-handed, and empty-bellied. The mighty hunter grunted, Me hungry, that red, uh, red stuff filled my belly. No joke, the narrator pulls no punches in this depiction. Not only does he have Esau forget the actual word for stew, he has him refer to eating like an animal rather than like a human. And in explicit contrast, Jacob is smooth and calculated. Sure, brother, just one thing. Give me your birthright, your claim to the family line and property, and you can help yourself. Esau could care less. Me dying, birthright not food, take, give food. Jacob grinned and handed the pot to his brother. Esau shoveled it down in rapid, brutus fashion and stalked off without a second thought. And thus ends the first encounter between the skilled hunter and the man of plain dealing. The second encounter comes a chapter later. Isaac is getting older and frailer. His vision has failed, and he thinks it's about time for him to croak. It turns out he's actually got another 20 years. But anyway, he decides to set his affairs in order and settle the estate on his eldest son, his favorite, Esau. So he calls Shaggy in and says in a quaver, Old am I, and I know not the day of my death. So go, hunt me some meat, make me a dish, and I will bless you before I die. But Rebecca has overheard and goes immediately to the heel, I mean Jacob, having convinced themselves that fate decreed the younger to be heir over the elder, 
the two set in motion a grand deceit. Jacob, the honest man, had only one concern. Would he get caught? No, Rebecca reassures him. And so Jacob entered his father's tent, clothed in his brother's clothes, carrying a mimic dish with hairy goat skins wrapped around his smooth-skinned forearms. When Jacob spoke, Isaac asked, Who are you, my son? A deep question indeed. Three times he interrogated his son, and three times Jacob deceived with words, touch, smell, and taste. And so Jacob the younger received the firstborn's sole blessing before dashing out in the nick of time as Esau came in from the fields with his own dish. Confident where Jacob was nervous, Esau delivered a formal request for blessing and then was shocked to hear, and who are you? When they both grasped the extent of Jacob's trickery, Esau's momentary reserve broke, and he cried out in anguish, Bless me, me also, father. Isaac replied, Alas, your brother came with deceit and took your blessing. And so Esau declares, Jacob is rightly heel sneaker, cheater, for now he has tripped me twice birthright and blessing taken. And get this, Jacob is the hero of our story. No, really, he wins. By the end of the book, he has a big family, he's wealthy, and yes, he's the third patriarch of a new nation. So here's our lesson. Clever cheaters succeed, the naive and trusting lose. It's fated to be so, right? I want to suggest there may be a subtler reading hidden just below the surface of this story. Remember back at the beginning when our narrator described Esau as a skilled hunter and Jacob as a simple and straightforward man? What if both were deeply ironic statements? After all, Jacob is about as far as from innocent as one can get, which is hinted at in the root of his name. Not Tam from pure, but Yaakov from Akop, crooked, yet still the deceit. So also maybe Esau is not the skilled hunter and war leader his father desires, being too simple hearted and generous for the vocation. Maybe all along, Isaac has been projecting onto his eldest his own frustrated longing rather than truly seeing him for who he is. For a scruffy, lumbering beefcake, Esau is surprisingly gentle, emotional, and caring. Maybe he truly does despise the vocational burden of the patriarchy bound up in his birthright, yet he longs for his father's blessing. Even in the moment of ultimate betrayal, when revenge on Jacob flashes across his mind, he hesitates to act out of fear of hurting his father. And when he is given ample opportunity later, Esau never actually threatens his brother. In fact, after Jacob leaves, and decades later they finally meet again, we see Esau run and hug and kiss and cry in sheer joy of seeing his brother, and he eagerly invites Jacob to join him in travel and living together again. What of Jacob? Well, we'll see more of his story in the next few weeks, and it's a story filled with more deceit, betrayal, and lies. Sometimes Jacob bests his opponents, and sometimes he loses. But the deeper story is that he can't escape that cycle. The exact way he betrays is the way that he himself is betrayed. 
constantly knowing himself suspicious, he always suspects and is suspicious of others. Yes, he succeeds in the outward dimensions recognized in competitive society. But when I slow down and think about it, it seems to me that it's the truly naive, simple, and innocent Esau who seems to have found inward peace and the ability to give and receive love that Jacob never fully finds. In claiming fate, Rebecca and Jacob both receive what they ask for, and they receive its consequences as well. Will there be redemption for the cheater? Can Jacob find a new name? Is he helpless before the fates, or can he choose differently? We'll have to wait and see. So for today, we might consider what success may truly mean and what we might be forced to sacrifice in order to attain what we may have been told is of ultimate value. Maybe Esau shows us a different way to be a hero outside the traditional script. Maybe a certain kind of success costs more than it's worth. Maybe it's a gift to be simple. Amen. Standing now, let us affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving help among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, 
you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We lift our prayers to God, who knows our necessities before we ask and rejoices in our asking. As we respond, hear us, good Lord. That judges, attorneys, and juries may be fair and just in their dealings with those who come before them, relying on the law and legal precedents and weighing their decisions with compassion and forbearance. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. That the church may welcome young adults into its life, inviting them into positions of responsibility and leadership, listening to their ideas, and joining with them in building for the future. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. That God's will may break through the hardened surfaces of those who release their despair through violence, abuse, gang membership, vengeful societies, and terrorist organizations, so that they may be changed into the architects of a peaceful and prosperous world. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord. Let the hope of the poor be not in vain, and those with a troubled spirit be not forgotten, but assisted through the generosity of those whose hearts are fertile soil in which the ministry of Christ bears much fruit. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord, that the leaders of the nations may usher in the peace of God's reign. Let us pray. Hear us, good Lord, that all who have returned to the dust may be raised to the glory of everlasting life. Let us pray. In the light that knows no setting of the sun, let us continue our prayers. We pray for Catherine, Tom, Lynn, Colleen, Marion, Marty, Mason, Jay, Jerry, Dan, Lauren, Irene, Kevin, Raylan, Shayla, Brenda, Chris, Mike, Alicia, Lee, Greg, Fred, Guy, Wendy, Donna, and Michael. And for all who have died in communion of your church, especially Jane Volmer, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Let us pray. Hear, Hear us, good Lord. We also pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, John, our priest, and Al, our deacon. On the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for Incarnation Ronsiford. And in our companion diocese in Colombia, we pray for the Reverend Archicero Cuervo Toro, from the Mission Episcopal Jesus Cristo Luis del Mundo. I now invite you to offer your own prayers of intercession or thanksgiving. Lord, we pray for this community, with the increasing cases of this virus in our county and in our state, that you will give us wisdom to listen and do what is right by those around us, to care for the most vulnerable, that you will protect those who are sick, care for those who are looking for jobs and in need of help. 
Equip us to be your hands for this work in this world, O oh Lord. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us join together now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for your, all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you in the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now it is time to celebrate for those who have birthdays or anniversaries in this coming week.
For our birthdays this week, we celebrate Kate, Mary Lou, Anna, Kevin, Kirsten, Rebecca, and Ori. Let us recite the birthday prayer together. Gracious God, as we rejoice in the birthdays of these your children, we pray that the year ahead will be one of blessing and peace, and that the year will bring continual joy in the knowledge of your steadfast grace and love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now anniversaries. We celebrate the anniversaries of Van and Brenda, Mike and Nancy, John and Pat, and myself, my wife, Miriam. Let us now recite our anniversary prayer together. Loving God, you have blessed these couples with the gift of marriage. We pray that they may continue to love, honor, and cherish each other, and that they will find in each other the reflection of your abiding and sustaining grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, it's time for a few announcements. So as I hope you have seen, we have a slightly changed schedule on our Sunday mornings. This service is broadcast at 9 a.m. And then this will be followed by our coffee hour at 10 a.m., which you can join via Zoom or via conference call. At 11, we will then begin our Wisdom Jesus book study group discussion. If you are one of those who really enjoy the National Cathedral service, then you can still join that after the coffee hour. So we hope to see a few of those who haven't been able to make it in the past. We will continue our evening prayer uh, services um, every week. However, we are changing it from Tuesday, when, Tuesday, Thursday to Wednesday only at 7.30, and that will be live on YouTube. I often will give a meditation on the readings afterward, and it's an enjoyable experience for those who come. Uh, I certainly enjoy it, and you are welcome to join at that at any time. This will be the schedule we will use um, at least through July and continue to um, evaluate and see where we are at with the virus and see what we might be able to uh, modify and change as we go. Um, so uh, be aware that we may be coming up with some new announcements for that as our vestry meets this week um, and uh, let you know how that goes. Other than that, we pray that you stay safe and healthy and that we continue to keep our community going as best we can in this time of pandemic. And now, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 